Momentum and Impulse is going to be the topic of this lesson in my brand new general physics playlist, which will eventually cover a full year of university algebra-based physics. Now, most students associate this chapter, uh, which is going to be on momentum, impulse, and collisions. They really focus on the collisions. It's the hardest part of this chapter. Before we can talk about it, we really got to talk about momentum and impulse, which should be the point of this lesson, and then in the next one, we'll cover the collisions. My name is Chad, and welcome to Chad's Prep, where my goal is to take the stress out of learning science. Now, if you're new to the channel, we've got comprehensive playlists for general chemistry, organic chemistry, general physics, and high school chemistry. And on chadsprep.com, you'll find premium master courses for the same that include study guides and a ton of practice. You'll also find comprehensive prep courses for the DAT, the MCAT, and the OAT. All right, so we got to have a little discussion about momentum. And uh, what if I told you that, uh, you know, yesterday uh, some, somebody was out for a ride and uh, they hit me doing 40 miles an hour? Uh, that would sound terrible, and I'm just going after sympathy votes for her. And, uh, what I didn't tell you is that the somebody was an amoeba, uh, and they were out for a ride because they were riding on the back of a mosquito, and they hit me doing 40 miles per hour. Uh, and obviously you're like, wow, that's one fast mosquito. I know that's what you were thinking. Uh, no, you're thinking, okay, facetious here, and the key here is that such a small mosquito with an amoeba on it, don't forget that part, uh, doesn't have a whole lot for momentum associated with it, and so colliding with me is not the biggest deal in the world like it would be if a person was out for a ride on a horse or in a car or something like that. So if we look at the definition of momentum here, and its uh, symbol is the lowercase letter p, it is a vector, FYI, so it has both magnitude and direction, but it's just equal to mass times velocity. And so the mass matters. So I told you that, you know, somebody was out for a ride and hit me doing 40 miles per hour, and I only hinted at the velocity, and it sounded terrible because I made it sound like it was a car accident or something like that. So, but the key is if it was the mass of a mosquito with an amoeba on it, who cares? It doesn't have a whole lot for momentum, and so it colliding with you is not the biggest deal in the world. So momentum has both those components, both mass and velocity. So, and momentum is directly proportional to both of them. You double the mass, you've doubled the momentum. You double the velocity, you've doubled the momentum. You double them both and you have quadrupled the momentum. So, but that's momentum. And again, it's a vector and it has the same direction as the velocity uh, as well, which is also obviously a vector. All right, so that is momentum. And again, it's a vector, which means uh, we're gonna have to worry about potentially breaking it up into X and Y components. Uh, and things of that sort. Sometimes we're gonna deal with two-dimensional problems as we'll see with collisions and stuff like that. So, but sometimes we're gonna deal with just one-dimensional problems. So, and more properly, we'll just call this linear momentum. And in a one-dimensional pro uh, problem, there's only one dimension and we don't have to worry about components. But as we'll see, we're, uh, we're gonna be working our way up towards these two-dimensional problems. Now, the second thing we'll talk about is what we call impulse. And impulse is also a vector. Turns out it's equal to force times the duration of time. So, uh, and it turns out if you wanna change something's momentum or change its motion, so to speak, uh, there's an impulse that is required and, and ultimately means there's a net force that needs to be applied. Cool, now notice the impulse is proportional to force, but it's also proportional to delta T. So let's say, you know, you get in a fight and you give somebody a quick push, you know? Uh, there's an impulse associated with that, but instead of giving them a quick push, what if you put your shoulder down and you just drive into them and you just keep pushing, keep pushing? So that's gonna be a greater impulse. And you might have only hit them with the same force in either case, either the quick push or where you got a push where you're just driving into them. But with the longer duration, there's gonna be a much greater impulse and you're gonna get a much bigger change uh, in their motion as we'll see in just a second. So, and again, we said there's gonna be a connection here between impulse and momentum, and we call that the impulse momentum theorem. So in that impulse momentum theorem here says that the impulse F delta T is gonna equal the change in an object's momentum. That's the connection here. So if we look at the units for both of these, there's no special SI units for momentum. We're just gonna use the base, the combination of base SI units that represent it. So mass is kilogram, velocity is meter per second. So it's simply just a kilogram meter per second. Well, if you look at force times time, that's gonna be a Newton second. Well, a Newton is a kilogram meter per second squared times a second, cancel out one of those seconds, and you're just left with a kilogram meter per second. So interestingly enough, these have the same units. The SI unit of impulse is also kilogram meters per second. And so now is not so surprising that we have this equality here because they have the same units. So, but we can derive this from Newton's second law. Let's take a look. So Newton's second law says F equals mass times acceleration, but we know acceleration is change in velocity over the change in time. 
So, and then we can move this over, delta t, get f delta t equals m delta v. So in the case, it's typically the velocity that's changing, not the mass. And so we could look at this one further away and make this delta mv, which is momentum. And so we now get the impulse is equal to the change in momentum. So we've, we've just kind of derived this impulse momentum theorem. So we're now just going to kind of tackle some problems. We're going to deal with some impulse problems, some momentum problems, and then some application of the impulse momentum theorem as well. All right, so we'll start easy and work our way up. First question says, a 1200 kilogram car is traveling with a velocity of 20.0 meters per second. What is its momentum? And again, momentum is just mass times velocity. And both of those are given. We can plug and chug as long as they're in SI units, and they are. So a 1,200 kilogram car is traveling 20.0 meters per second. So we could probably do this in our head. So 1,200 times 2 is 2,400, but times 20, add another zero, is going to be 24,000. So, and in this case, again, kilogram meters per second is the unit, and that's the magnitude of the momentum, and it's in the same direction as whatever direction the velocity was in. All right, so second question here, a 1,200 kilogram car traveling at a velocity, 20.0 meters per second, that should sound familiar, uh, hits a cow, that's new. So you should also know that uh, the cow gets up and walks away, no cow is injured in this question. Uh, the cow applies an average force of 90,000.0 newtons for 0 0.20 seconds to the car in the direction opposite to its motion. What is the impulse caused by the cow on the car? And what is the velocity of the car after hitting the cow? So two part question. And the first part again is just what is the impulse of the cow on the car? And here we've got the definition of impulse right here. And so impulse just equals F delta T and those numbers are given. And so here we're told that the force of the cow on the car is 90,000 newtons. And that's 90,000.0 newtons. So, and then delta T here we're given as 0 0.20 seconds. Now, before we move on, so in all likelihood, we're gonna be defining the velocity of the car as the positive direction. And this force right here is in the opposite direction. And so technically this would be a negative 90,000 newtons kind of in that paradigm. And that's why the impulse is gonna come out negative as well, super important that we keep in mind the directions here and the signs that that affects on, on our different vector quantities. All right, so if we work this out, so you can probably do this in your head, good time to pull out your calculator anyways, but do it in your head. Uh, multiplying by 0.2 is the same thing as dividing by five. And my personal favorite way though is just to multiply by 0.1 and then double it, because multiplying by 0.1 is the same thing as dividing by 10, and we just move it back a decimal place and that's negative 9,000, and then doubling that would be negative 18,000. And that's going to be not newton seconds, I mean technically it is newton seconds, but more properly kilogram meters per second. That is the impulse of the cow on the car. Now the second part of that question is what is the velocity of the car after hitting the cow? And this is where the impulse momentum theory is going to come into play. Now we've written it as F delta T equals delta P, but we can technically write this as just I equals delta p since we've already solved for the impulse in the previous part of the question we don't have to actually substitute in f delta t we'll just substitute in our value here of negative 18,000 kilogram meters per second and so we can say negative 18,000 kilogram meters per second is going to equal here and again uh, change in momentum is going to be p final minus p initial which would be mv final minus mv initial and technically, it's the same mass either way of that car, and so we could factor that out as well. So, but I'm going to leave it out just like that. And we're going to get negative 18,000 kilogram meters per second equals that 1,200 kilogram car. The final velocity is what we want. And the initial velocity was that 20 meters per second. All right, so in this case, we can see that 1,200 times 20, well, 1,200 times two would be 2,400. So 1,200 times 20, add that extra zero, is 24,000. And so we're subtracting 24,000 kilogram meters per second, but we'll add it to the other side. And so adding a 24,000 to a negative 18,000 is gonna get us 
6,000 kilogram meters per second is going to equal 1,200 kilograms times that final velocity. And we'll divide through by 1,200 to figure that out. And in this case, we could just look at that as being equivalent to 60 divided by 12. Those two zeros are going to cancel. And 60 divided by 12 is 5, and that is indeed the final velocity. And with the appropriate number of sig figs, like we need two based on the time that was given above, two sig figs, so it's 5.0 meters per second. And it is positive, which means the car is still moving in the same direction it was traveling. It hits the cow and slows down tremendously, but it's still moving in the forward direction with a velocity of 5.0 meters per second. So another one with yet again this 1200 kilogram car. A 1200 kilogram car is traveling with a velocity of 20.0 meters per second. If it is hit by a truck, and this is an if, it's purely hypothetical. Again, nobody injured, no actual accidents here. But if it is hit by a truck, causing it to move backward with a velocity of 10 meters per second after the collision, what is the car's change in momentum? So we want the change in momentum here. And again, that's equal to final momentum minus initial momentum, which in this case is equal to mv final minus mv, let's get a big V there. V initial, didn't want to subscript V. Cool, and this is gonna be our calculation. The thing we gotta be careful with here is signs yet again. So in this case, the car is initially moving in this direction with a velocity of 20 meters per second, but it gets in a head-on collision with a truck and ends up in the end moving backwards with a velocity of 10 meters per second. And we've got to account for that. A lot of students will do this calculation uh, a little bit wrong. So if we look at this change in velocity, this change in velocity is not going to be 10 meters per second. So if he went down from 20 meters per second down to 10 meters per second in the same direction, that would be a change in velocity of 10 meters per second. If he went from 20 meters per second down to a complete stop, that would now be a change, and I guess technically of negative 20 meters per second. But in this case, not only does it not come to just a complete stop, he's actually heading back the other direction. The velocity has changed by negative 30 meters per second. So, and that's what kind of students sometimes miss on something like this, where there's a change in direction in a one-dimensional problem like this. So, but if we take a look here, so delta P is gonna equal that 1200 kilograms. So final velocity, again, in the opposite direction is negative 10 meters per second, minus again, that 1200 kilograms times the positive 20 meters per second. All right, now we can do a little bit of math here. Uh, and in this case, 1200 times negative 10 is gonna be negative 12,000 kilogram, let's get this right, kilogram meters per second. Uh, and then minus 1200 times 20 is gonna be minus 24,000 kilogram meters per second. And so we've got a negative number subtracting another number. So, and in this case, your change in momentum, it's gonna end up being negative 36,000 kilogram meters per second. Cool, and again, just accounting for that change in direction, super important. A lot of students would have missed one of the negative signs here. So the next question is gonna involve a hitter hitting a baseball off a tee from rest. And if you're completely unfamiliar with baseball, those might mean nothing to you. I had a friend from India who plays only cricket play baseball with us this last weekend. It was a hoot, because he doesn't know any of the rules. So if you're completely unfamiliar with baseball, a tee holds a baseball stationary that you can practice hitting and hit a stationary ball, a ball that is still, a ball that has no velocity, and hit it off the tee to kind of work on your form. That way, hopefully, you're better when a ball is actually being pitched towards you later on. So that's what it means when a ball is hit off a tee. And so the question says, a hitter hits a 0 0.10 kilogram baseball off of a tee. I put in parentheses from rest for those who aren't familiar. Uh, if the average force applied by the bat to the ball is 10,000.0 newtons and the velocity of the ball immediately after being hit is 40.0 meters per second, how long was the bat in contact with the ball? So we're wanting duration of time here. And so we can see that this ball is having its momentum change because it has no momentum and is going to a situation where it's going to have momentum, have velocity in this case. So there must be an impulse involved. We're told the force part of that impulse what we're not told is how long, and that's what we're being asked to solve for. 
So it's that impulse momentum theorem yet again. So we're going to have F delta T equals delta P, which we can write out again as F delta T equals MV final minus MV initial and go from there. So uh, in this case, again, the force is given as 10,000 newtons. Time is not given. So mass in this case, I'll, I'm going to factor that out and make it 0.1, oh, 0 0.10. Let's get that right for sig fig's sake. And I'm going to factor that out and just do V final minus V initial. And so in this case, V final is 40 meters per second and initially was zero, so minus zero. And there's a problem. And all we got to do is simply solve for delta T. And so in this case, delta T is going to equal 0 0.10 kilograms times 40 meters per second all over 10,000 newtons. And again, you can look at that Newton as a kilogram meter per second squared, which is why when you take kilogram meters per second and divide it by a kilogram meter per second squared, you're going to come out with units of seconds. All right, so take a look at this. So 40 times 0.1 is going to be 4, and 4 divided by 10,000. Let's see what that comes out to. And I'm going to use my calculator here. We could probably do this without, but hey, let's just use the calculator. We're going to get 4 times 10 to the negative 4. Uh, in this case, we want 2 sig figs limited by the mass. So 4.0 times 10 to the negative 4 seconds. So, and that's an SI unit. So this is about 0.4 milliseconds, which is not far from the actual truth of how long a typical... Uh, bat is in contact with a ball in a typical swing in baseball. And that sums up this lesson. If you found it helpful, consider giving it a like. Happy studying.